So first of all, thank you, Warren, for inviting me to the talk. Uh, hugely appreciated. This is a um, a talk. That this is basically a talk that was uh, that, that both myself and my colleague Mike McCracken have given to various audiences in the United States and in the Europe, and we've and I'm condensing it down to ten minutes. So yeah, so I'm, I'm going to go through some of the slides fairly quickly. But just to introduce, first uh, of all, actually, uh, Kevin, we have um, uh, Jacob. How many minutes do we have? We all I think we have uh, less for the, and we want to leave a little bit of room for um, question and answer too. So yeah, yeah, we like to keep the presentations to around ten minutes. Um, yeah, we ten move minutes. On. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. I'm squeezing it down to the to the okay. ten minutes. Yeah, sure. I'm not going to go on for forty-five. Don't worry about that. So. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the slides fairly quickly, and then we'll discuss the 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 um, the, the issues in the um, in, in the uh, in the subsequent sessions. So, firstly, uh, Restore Our Climate is a nonprofit um, that, that's registered in California, and what our objective is is to develop the technology, the science, the market conditions around this idea of iron salt aerosols, which are a nature-based solution for giving us a significant um, option for climate um, in intervention. So I wanna talk a little bit about that, but also what I want to do is really set the context for why we have to start really accelerating the, the whole um, um, game for, for climate intervention. So I wanna talk a little bit about the climate intervention requirements. I wanna look at, at the science that will dictate a climate intervention and then give some reasons for being cheerful. And within the science, I'll explain why the iron salt aerosol really uh, give, gives us a good step forward. So where are we with climate change? Well, climate change is probably the, the biggest failure of global governance. And it's really important, I think, just to sometimes step back and understand why we are failing so badly to, to govern um, climate change. And I think that yeah, the starting point of that failure was in 1992 at the UNFCC when we had the first COP and the targets for, 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 um, for climate change were laid down. And the idea was we would limit temperatures to two degrees Celsius, which meant that we could kind of keep business as usual. We could keep our eye over the shoulder a little bit on climate change, but basically we didn't really need to do too much. Time moves on. The temperature gets to one degree Celsius and we start thinking there's a bit of a problem there. So what we then do is we then say, okay, well, halfway between where we are and where we want to go is 1.5. Let's make that a new target. But these targets are all politically set targets. They are not scientifically based targets. And without that clear understanding of a, of a scientifically based target, we are always going to be adrift in terms of our, our approach to climate change. So, where are we now at one degree Celsius? This list adds, you know, I add to this list every time I do this presentation, we are seeing our ecosystem effectively collapse in front of our eyes. The, the thing I've had to put up this week is the extreme summer and winter time um, um, Arctic temperatures in both the Arctic now and the, and the um, Antarctic. So one degree Celsius or 1.16 above baseline, things are already starting to fall apart seriously. So the prospect of going to 1.5 or 2 is not compatible with the initial objectives that were laid down by the UNFCC. So the next question is, well, why are things starting to go so badly? And this is a debate that we presented to the UN in the, um, in the Talanoa dialogue discussion. And I'm potentially speaking to the converted here. But one of the big things that everyone talks about and everyone's familiar with is the idea of feedback loops. So we, we, you know, we know the idea of the Arctic feedback loop and the methane feedback loop. So as we move along the, the x-axis down here, we've got time. And over time, we melt some, some, um, some sea ice. The, the melted sea ice allows more heat into the ocean, which melts more sea ice. And we get this exponential growth in sea ice loss. And we can see a similar kind of thing for methane. And these are kind of hypothetical, just standard models for, it, for a feedback system. And these are the things that we're always kind of concerned about. Now, the big question is, is what happens if there is interaction between the feedbacks? And if the Arctic 
Arctic feed, if the Arctic melts, uh, ice melting feeds back methane release, and the methane release feeds back Arctic, um, Arctic melting, then what you get is a step change. As soon as you see any change at all, you then get a very rapid transition to a hot house condition. So paper that we put into the UN, we argued that this level of, of, of um, interconnectivity between feedback mechanisms is not understood within the, the current debate and it's not recognized within the, within the IPCC. And in the models that we put together, what we showed was that that step, that the profile of that step change is really only dependent on two things. It's dependent on the number of feedback mechanisms that we've got and the correlations between them rather than the individual dynamics. So we don't even know what all the feedback mechanisms are. We certainly don't know what the correlations are between them. And that leads to the conclusion that climate change is likely to be far more sensitive to the CO2 changes that, that, we, that we have instigated. And in particular, that climate change will be far more sensitive in the, in the polar regions. And also, once we get that transition, then we get stuck in a hot house earth condition and we can't come back even with climate intervention. And I'm also an expert reviewer for the, um, for the IPCC. And finally, the IPCC are now recognizing in the, um, in the current um, draft that's uh, due out next year, that they cannot predict, or the current climate models cannot predict Arctic amplification. You know, they, they, they say that they can predict global average temperature increases, but not Arctic amplification. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an oxymoron of a statement. They can't predict um, global uh, uh, Arctic amplification. Therefore, they also can't predict accurately the, um, the, the average global temperature increase. So that's kind of where we are. So what that then leads to, towards, and this is the, the paper that we put into the, um, the Tanaloa, is what would be a scientifically based temperature target that we must work towards? Well, that must be round about 0 0.5 degrees Celsius above baseline or less. And that's the temperature when things started changing on, on the planet, when we started seeing interacting and accelerating feedback mechanisms first be, being kicked off. So that was around about 1980. So we saw three principal things, mass bleaching of the coral reefs. We saw um, initial ice loss in the, in the Arctic, and we saw initial methane losses. So these are three things all intimately tied together. So our proposition is we need to be stabilizing the temperature back down to 0.5. It is fundamentally important that we understand what a science-based target actually is rather than a politically based target. And so that's kind of, yeah, that's the, fit, the basic framework that really sort of drives um, the necessity for having a climate intervention strategy. So next big question then is what kind of strategy do we need to try and bring the temperature down to 0.5 degrees Celsius? Well, the big focus on climate change, and rightly so, is to stop CO2 emissions. CO2, atmospheric CO2, and this is just from the normal Mauna Loa um, graph, which almost everyone has seen, is going up. And also the rate of increase is going up. So back about sort of eight, nine years ago, when I wrote The Vortex of Violence, I suggested that with that increasing rate of, of, of increase, by 2030, we would be at 450 ppm, and we're well on track for that at the moment. So the problem that we've got is that we are effectively in an accelerating car. If you want to stop a car, you have to stop it accelerating, then apply the brakes. Well, we haven't even stopped atmospheric CO2 accelerating at this stage. So we're well, we're well into an accelerating scenario there. So let's play the hypothetical. Let's imagine if we stop CO2 emissions and in a hypothetical world, we go to renewables immediately tomorrow. Would that allow CO2 emissions to reduce? Well, actually, no. If we correlate cumulative emissions with atmospheric CO2, we get a perfect straight line. So if we stop CO2 emissions tomorrow, then all that's going to happen is that the CO2 will stay at a, an unacceptably high level. And when we first did this analysis, we expected to see some kind of curve. And from that curve, you know, we would be able to calculate what the natural rate of, of permanent sequestration was in the planet. We found a straight line. So that really implies that, car, that permanent sequestration is not even measurable compared with fossil fuel burning emissions. You know, quite, 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 a, quite a profoundly um, 
shocking and, and disturbing conclusion. So we look for justification. Well, the, the other sort of validation of that hypothesis that the emission rate is extremely slow is in the Vostok ice core. And what we see over the last four Milenkovich cycles is a downward trend in CO2 emissions, and we can work out what the rate per year is. And we're kind of coming up to this trajectory. If we were to rely purely on natural um, 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 reduction rates, we would take something in the order of 250,000 years to come back down to a safe CO2 level, which our climate can restabilize that. And that's clearly not going to happen. And at the same time, we've, we've now got this enormous heat flow going into the Arctic, which is now potentially melting the subsea permafrost and is going to release gigatons of, of, of methane into the Arctic atmosphere. And this process is already starting. So um, can we get CO2? I'm, I'm doing for time. I'm, get, I'm getting pushed on time. OK, yeah. so CO2 emissions, this is basically from the, um, the, the um, IPCC 1.5 report, suggests that we can reduce emissions down like this. Well, well we can't. There, there is no practical processes to remove CO2 out the atmosphere at a rate which we need to stabilize the climate. So what we're left with is two things. We are left with solar radiation management, and we're left with the removal of short-lived greenhouse gases like methane, like, like tropospheric ozone. And that's where we start coming into the, um, well, in fact, I'm, I'm jumping forward a, a slide here. I'm just, just uh, you know, I'm trying to make sure I don't run, run out of time. But what we, you know, what we need to do is we need to start looking at the solar radiation management. We need to look at the removal of short-lived um, um, greenhouse gases. And we need to be able to do that for a long period of time. We need to change our thinking about CO2 to something akin to the way that we think about nuclear waste. We need to think how we can deliver something to future societies that will enable them to manage the radiative imbalance that the planet is going to be, that they are going to be facing. And that's where we come with the idea of iron salt aerosols, um, which we're extremely excited by. And, this is the idea that we disperse iron salts in the atmosphere. And this is a natural process that happens already. So when we get dust blowing off the Sahara, it's iron rich. When we get dust blowing off the, um, off, off the, 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 um, the Arabian Peninsula over the Persian Gulf, it's iron rich and it fertilizes and enriches the, the, the ocean ecosystems in these areas. So what we see is the idea of really trying to develop that natural process much further. The other incredible benefit that iron salts have got and, and other types of metallic salts is that they can act catalytically and photocatalytically with gases like methane, tropospheric ozone, CO, HCF, CCFs, and so forth. So we disperse iron salts at a very small, at a very low concentration with very small droplet sizes, and that photocatalytically breaks down methane at a rate of about 200 times faster than natural processes on their own. So potentially we have a, have a solution here to start tackling the high levels of methane that are coming from anthropogenic sources and also now being released from natural sources. Dispersal of the iron salts also increases um, ocean biomass. And again, that's a way of bringing down CO2 out of the atmosphere and also providing an enriched food source for future civilizations as they, as they I'm, challenge. I'm sorry, people. Kevin, uh, we're running a little short on time, but we can, um, uh, I've, I'm going to ask everyone to save clarifying questions for Kevin after, uh, for the moderate panel discussion. And um, I'll let you finish your uh, last idea and then I'll. I'll... Okay, C cool. Okay. I've Thank pretty much so finished. Much. Yeah, yeah, pretty much finished now. So, okay. so yeah. So, we, you know, we've got the idea that we can increase um, ocean biomass. The other important thing is there is a direct cooling effect. The, the, um, the, the, as, as, it, as the iron salts go into the atmosphere, we create cloud condensation, nucleation particles for clouds. So we basically brighten clouds mm -hmm. and we can manipulate the size of the particles to start giving that, that level of cloud brightening. So we're pretty excited by it. The, the science is, is, is there. Um, all we need to do is prove it and we need to prove it really quick. We need a program really running over this next, over this winter period 
so we can start getting ready for field testing next summer so we can start getting ready to present to the COP next year. So that's, you know, in a rough pre-seat, that's kind of, kind of where we are. Thank you, Kevin. My um, pleasure. Our next panelist is Warren Linney. Warren has been uh, fighting climate change for over 20 years with several organizations. Uh, they're a board member of Senior VP of Forever Redwood, founder of the nonprofit World Stewardship Institute, and the co-founder of SF Bay Climate Restoration Circle. All right. All right. Okay, so um, thank you, Kevin. Very exciting. Um, the, the question is, you know, how do we fund that? Um, they're only looking for $50,000 to do some lab testing to, to prove this. And this is just one of many uh, different um, climate solutions, natural climate solutions like planting trees and more seaweed and everything. And what's particularly exciting about uh, Kevin's and, and what I want to talk about, how are we going to get, how are we going to fund things like this that we're actually going to move um, CO2 down? Um, it's, what's exciting is that this one is only a dollar per ton of CO2 equivalent to actually uh, reduce, you know, in the atmosphere and it would actually fertilize the ocean and, you know, bring back that that uh, green ocean that we want right now. Um, at the city level, we have, um, and I'm, I'm talking also not just, you know, to the Bay Area cities, but we're talking now to Glasgow, Scotland, um, Mark Hibbert there, who's researching whether we can put a ballot measure um, on the, you know, the city ballots. And Berkeley and Albany are doing that um, for this November and perhaps other cities too. And this is a, a climate finance um, mechanism that's annual and that it would actually um, allow citizens to participate, not just by voting, but um, in the Green New Deal, uh, by funding um, new, new jobs in uh, um, solar panels, planting fruit trees, for example, um, money that the cities don't have right now and it's really, you know, some a way to fund the climate plans that are in every city and, and a lot of the, the cities um, internationally have passed a climate emergency resolution. And so now, you know, the next step is how does, how does that actually get funded? Um, and we, we look to a city um, in Colorado, Boulder, Colorado, who 10 years ago uh, funded or passed a ballot measure to raise the, the utility tax. Um, so most cities in California have a utility tax on electricity, natural gas, and um, cell phones and cable and so forth. And so what they did in Boulder, Colorado is actually raise the tax um, to fund climate, their climate plan. And so they've actually avoided emissions of a million tons of CO2 in the last 10 years. Um, and they've put in a lot of bike lanes, they've planted a lot of trees, and they've actually uh, created a lot of jobs. So we're looking at that as our, our model. Berkeley is taking that up um, in our climate finance. Um, uh, maybe Sheila will put on, the, on, our, on our chat the link to our campaign. Um, we've gotten about 20 cities in the Bay Area very interested in putting it on the, on the ballot. And it's usually a two-year process, so we're going to see a lot more uptake um, besides Berkeley and Albany uh, in the next year or two. Uh, and we're we're falling on not just you know taxing natural gas, gas, which is a great thing because it reduces the use of, of fossil fuel and funds climate, but also there's other indirect things like Uber and Lyft that can be taxed. Um, there's other um, regional gas taxes that we can do that will fund climate as well. And so we're um, looking at MTC, <clears throat> ABAG, uh, the different uh, um, climate, you know, groups that are regionally that uh, can take this up. But the city in particular, uh, it's very exciting because the cities can put a tax on, uh, say, the large users of natural gas, like the five refineries, in the Bay Area, Richmond and uh, Martinez, Benicia, 
et cetera, and they can actually put the tax on these large polluters by a vote of the people in the cities. And, the, and basically, you know, if it's a large installation like that, they have to pay the tax or they have to, you know, shut down and leave town, you know, and so they're not gonna do that with the refineries. So this is a very powerful mechanism um, that the city, you know, the, the people um, can vote for. And we're advocating that some of that money that's raised actually come back to the, vo the voters, the citizens to, um, you know, do their own climate resilience with solar panels, you know, fruit trees, insulate their house, and it'll be a, a real incentive for businesses um, as well, any building owner to um, lower the emissions, get to net zero emissions, because not only do people not want to pay a higher tax, but they want to actually, you know, zero out their utility, utility bill if they can. So um, this will provide funding um, grants and low interest loans to do that. So um, I'm going to leave it for anybody who has any questions that uh, um, we want to do that now, Jacob, or? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, we, we should open up to questions. If anyone has any questions, they can. Yeah, I think we have three or four minutes still. If there's a... You can directly message those questions to Warren if you'd like, or you can place them in the chat. Uh, Jan says, would you, t would your tax require a two thirds vote? Um, the way we're d designing the tax for the city ballots is a 50% um, yes vote. And so the money would go to general fund and we're actually um, advocating that the city pass an ordinance or a second measure saying that, okay, if this passes um, the higher utility tax, then the money would be allocated to climate. Okay, any, any other questions? Are there any questions in your chat, Warren? Or uh, let me see. I don't think so. Okay, um, Eckhart I see, I see, says. I see a comment about Ventura County excise mm -hmm. tax on natural gas on gas extraction. Right, that's. Um, Los Angeles, Long Beach has a uh, per barrel tax, and we're looking to see if that can be done for the refineries too. So I would, what, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, what we're, so what, <clears throat> what this campaign is, is to um, really help cities um, per, actually customize with a menu of different taxes that can be done in, in a city um, help them customize what that ta which taxes to uh, put before the voters um, and what the allocation should be um, in you know some cities have a lot of agricultural areas so they could be doing um, agricultural regeneration and so forth some and most cities don't have um, you know a lot of land but they could be participating in what Kevin um, Lister just introduced us to they could be helping to fund um, something um, with the iron salt aerosols that could be done in every city. And, and, uh, and then that would be actually, as it's verified, how much CO2 it's sequestering in the oceans um, would actually, how much methane it's you know, actually destroying. That would be, um, if, it's a if it really is a dollar a ton to do that, right now the open market is twenty dollars a ton so it could be a profit center for cities and uh and the, and the citizens of course would benefit too the city would have a source of funding ongoing because there's <laughs> as we know billions of tons we need to remove uh, actually a trillion so it's a it's a huge market for cities to get into any other questions wow. do we have um a couple questions here and we'll, we'll wrap it up after linda's the first one is from Eckhart uh, C. U. Betty. Is there a coalition of mayor states on this front? Could you could this not help gather in publicity and momentum? Yes, um, Eckhart, great question. <laughs> in fact, Eckhart is helping research this. There's a um, the Los Angeles mayor is um, is the chair of one of the largest um, C40. It's called it's a Sustainable Cities Coalition, and that's one of the places we're going to go next um there's also 
um, a lot of different uh, mayors that have um, joined together to counter, you know, us leaving the Paris Accord. We had a big conference 2018 with Jerry Brown leading that. Um, so yes, with, that's a, an access point. So we're, we're encouraging everybody, anybody wants to help us um, to go to our uh, link that's I think on the chat. And if Sheila's put that up there. Yeah, it's, it's in there. Yeah, so we, we have, and Sheila's our volunteer coordinator and we'd love to uh, help, you know, we need more help, of course, to make this uh, Bay Area and statewide and global campaign as we move past this election. Um, one more question about Amazon. Melinda? Um, yeah, there's yeah. a, there's a, um, yeah, there's definitely a proposal we're researching and we need some help if you want to help us on that to figure out how to tax Amazon because that's in every city almost in the world now. So um, cities could be taxing uh, the delivery service, um, you know, they're putting a lot of uh, vehicle miles on the road. And um, that's, that's part of the, why we're looking at Lyft and Uber, um, Berkeley and other cities to do that tax. Um, also another one's the, the uh, real estate transfer tax. Vancouver's got a 15% tax on um, offshore money that's buying real estate. So that could be a huge way to access the, uh, um, you know, money that's just sitting there in investments that really could be helping this climate solution. Awesome. So um, we're pleased to announce uh, our next speaker. Thank you, uh, Warren. Yep. Um, Jackie has co-founded, uh, Jackie Filter. She's co-founded the San Francisco Public Bank Coalition and is currently running for our California State Senate in District 11. Hey everyone, uh, I'm coming to you from my phone because my internet is down. So uh, thank you for your patience. Um, yeah, I just want to, to explain the story behind public banking because it is intimately connected with the fight for climate justice. So um, back in 2016, I saw on my screens, you know, on my timelines, on social media, um, my own relatives facing down the barrel of guns at Standing Rock. As we all know, it was the site of a major protest against the Dakota Access Pipeline, one of dozens, if not hundreds, of pipelines crisscrossing this continent. And I visited for a very short time, but when I came back to the Bay Area, I, I was inspired by a very hyper-local movement burgeoning in Seattle that was led by um, Matt Remley and Rachel Heaton, who are both indigenous organizers. And they were working closely with the city council, especially council member Kashama Swant, and they led you know, more than 700 people into a finance committee meeting. It must have broken a Guinness uh, World Book <laughs> records record for the number of people in a finance committee meeting. So they were there because they wanted to see how to get the city's $3 billion budget out of the hands of all the Wall Street banks that had been financing the pipeline, which are basically all, all the name brand ones you can think of. Um, you know, uh, at that time, I didn't know a thing about finance. I was had only a, a layman's understanding of how legislation moved in at the local level. But I saw that and wanted to do the same thing here in San Francisco. It turns out that we have a about six billion dollar pooled investment fund. Um, our budget is eleven billion dollars, and when we're not using it. Uh, to you know, make payroll or pay for different agencies in a given day. It's all sitting in those, in those banks, at least in their hands. And so I got in touch with them and I started basically to, to organize online and then in person, drawing people to our local board of supervisors meetings to, to ask them to, to divest our funds. Now, you know, the, the pool investment fund and, and kind of the, the cash management uh, hadn't undergone much scrutiny um, 
in a long time. We have a social responsibility investment index to guide the treasurer's decisions around where to invest and where not to invest. And the treasurer is, is basically the person with all of the, the power to decide how the city's monies are managed. And so, um, you know, for the past few years, we've been organizing to get a, a pathway of sorts at the local level for our own municipal public bank. We wanted to see if credit unions and smaller banks could take over our funds, but they were too small. And so we don't have, you know, that option. So uh, we've been working and, and you know, now for <laughs> three years, almost four years now on this issue with the Board of Supervisors to see what options there are. Uh, it's a bit of uncharted territory. However, there is the public bank that's in North Dakota. It's the only one standing. It's been around for a hundred years. It was started by farmers in 1919 after they were largely excluded from the Wall Street banks and they needed a way to get in, get their foothold into the farming industry. And so this was also during kind of a, a populist movement over there as well. And they start out as a grain mill, turn into a public bank, and you know, fast forward to the recession of 2009. They're they're doing swimmingly. They're countercyclical. They are also, as far as all the 50 states, they have the highest per capita for for uh, credit unions. And you know, as, as a San Francisco Public Bank Coalition. We are, we are wanting to push for a public bank specifically because we, we start from the premise that the Wall Street banks cannot be reasoned with. Uh, I had the opportunity to go on an indigenous women's delegation to Europe where we were talking with um, Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse and UBS and other banks about their financing of the Dakota Access Pipeline. And, you know, th these were conversations in 2017, uh, a year after the pipeline had been put into the ground. And so, you know, having even, even the, the, the well-documented human rights abuses, uh, you know, corroborated by the UN uh, special report, rapporteurs, uh, that were on the ground there wasn't enough for these banks to end their relationship with them and end these credit facility agreements. And, you know, it, it's a, it's a whole world of, of finance to get into, but basically uh, just this past week uh, we found out that Zurich insurance who had covered insurance for um, a number of pipelines was not going to renew their agreement and, and coverage of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which we had also mentioned as we were visiting them in 2017. So there are small wins here and there, but it's intimately tied to, you know, uh, insurance ratings and credit ratings and riskiness, which goes back to, you know, Moody's report and everything else. And so for us at the San Francisco Public Bank Coalition, our, our main frame of mind has just been to think global and act local. We want a public bank to expand the lending capacity of credit unions, of smaller banks, to extend credit to, to through those banks and institutions to finance things that we actually need locally, like affordable housing and renewable energy and public infrastructure and small businesses. As we've seen with the Bank of North Dakota, they've been able to help their customers via these smaller institutions that are communally based uh, obtain PPP loans. And you know, there's such a there's such a gap in help, obviously, at the federal level. But um, it would be it would just be another sense of autonomy for our local economies that are struggling right now. And so. Uh, locally, you know, it's been an uphill battle just to try to find the political will to capitalize this bank. Um, you know, we're, we're also in kind of a, a back and forth with 
um, the treasurer as to when this bank can be profitable, how risky it is, uh, what it would invest in, and really it comes down to an issue of governance as well. So who is deciding what is, an, it, what is this public bank going to invest in? Um, you know, you, we're, not, we're not Wall Street banks. We're not trying to maximize profits for shareholders. We're trying to serve the public good here in San Francisco and even regionally. And so we want to make sure that the priorities, the lending priorities of this bank are dictated by the interests, you know, to the furthest, furthest extent possible democratically by the people of San Francisco. And so right now we are, uh, actually this morning, we've just released a statement because our city uh, budget and legislative analyst office has found that actually a public bank could be profitable pretty quickly. And it's not going to cost as much as uh, the treasurer's report found. Mm -hmm. And um, it is a pathway to recovery, in fact. And so, you know, at this point in time, you know, given the circumstances of the pandemic, it's obviously a question for pretty much every single expenditure and in, in every level of a governance budget. But, you know, are we going to shirk back and push austerity on people and communities and our line items that really can't afford it, like public schools? Or are we going to ask more of those who can afford more, ask more of the billionaires who are consolidating their billions mm. um, to preserve our own autonomy over our future? Yes. And we I have think questions. That, we have one more minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, happy to take any questions right now, or at least one quick one. Uh, sure. Yes. Uh, please direct your questions to the chat. We can take one question. Um, we have one uh, here. I believe that this great panel and the participants here could meet again to see how we can collaborate and connect all these dots ongoing. Your thoughts? Yeah, sounds good. I also just want to give a quick update. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be around for the questions, but Sylvia is going to present on the state level stuff, which is super important for the local level movement and, uh, and you can direct probably a lot of questions to Sylvia as well. Okay. Okay. We'll save questions for the moderated panel then. Um, I guess, I guess we'll move on to Sylvia, um, our final panelist. Um, she's a policy director and Asian Pacific environment for the, with the Asian Pacific environmental network and co-chairs the legislative committee of, of the public California public banking Alliance. Hi, um, can you give me screen share access or do I already have it? I already have it, okay, I see it. I've got a PowerPoint. All right, um, yeah, thanks everyone. And thanks Jackie for that, uh, the story of public banking. Um, I also came to public banking in a similar way, um, seeing, the um, the action at Standing Rock and hearing the call for divestment and trying to divest our local governments. Um, I went to this, I, I, I'm based in Oakland. I went to Oakland City Council um, when they were voting on their contract with their bank and made the argument that you know we should not be investing in um, projects that you know, like the city of Oakland is currently like in lawsuits about like suing about the climate change damages that are being caused by these banks um, and all the other other problems with these uh, these projects. Um, and then, you know, over time found out that there are no alternatives to the big banks um, for, for local governments. For, for personal finances, I definitely recommend that you join a credit union or um, a local community bank that does ethical banking, but for the size of like large cities, um, there's no alternative right now. And which is why we passed um, AB 857. Um, but I'll get into that in a minute. Um, first, I, I wanted to give a little more background about like what is public banking. Um, 
the general definition is it's when a government entity owns and operates a bank. Um, and it's a, a very common model around the world, although it does not exist in the US except for the Bank of North Dakota, and now also the Territorial Bank of American Samoa. But around the world, um, there are something like, depending on your definition, um, there's something like 700 public banks. And depending on your definition, there's from $5 trillion to $38 trillion in assets that are held by public banks. So there's, that's a lot of money that we could be tapping into to address the, the climate crisis. Um, as a, um, just in, in general, like there, there are a lot of different estimates about how much the world needs to be investing in climate uh, action. Um, one that I saw, I've seen in a few places is that uh, $90 trillion is required from between the years 2015 and 2030 to be on track, I think this is on track with the Paris Accord. Um, and that $90 trillion is greater than the value of all current infrastructure stock. And that accounts for 3.4 to $6 trillion a year. And currently there's a annual climate finance, uh, annual climate, fi climate financing is about $546 billion a year. And roughly half of that is public. Um, so, one, there's a lot of different things that the public sector can be doing in terms of uh, investing that money and how, and using different financial tools to, um, to fund climate investments. Um, why are we interested in public banking? As Jackie mentioned, it keeps money local. So that's both um, local loans, uh, with existing funds, and then also the, the profits are returned to local governments. So it could be a profit center for local governments. Um, and uh, banks are able to leverage and create money to benefit the public. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't really think about when they're interacting with their banks. So there's kind of a simple di uh, graphic here that shows um, like how this works. Basically, when the city puts money into a bank, um, either which would be like the deposit as well as any kind of fees, um, the bank keeps a fraction of that in reserve and then uh, creates more money that goes out in loans. And so that money creating uh, ability is what's so transformational about public banking. Oh, and I also, I think I sped through this a little bit, but the Bank of North Dakota model is very interesting. Jackie mentioned it a bunch, so I, I don't want to go into too much detail, um, but you'll see on the slide that um, it, it makes sense from an economic angle, like just pure dollars. Um, the Bank of North Dakota has had 15 consecutive years of record profits and returns. Uh, the, the state's return on investment in 2018, which is the most recent year that data is available, was 18%. Um, they've returned over a billion dollars to the state over the first 99 years of its existence. And um, is attributed, uh, North Dakota's like uh, relative success in the 2008 recession is attributed in part to the Bank of North Dakota, um, as well as the um, the recent PPP loans, the paycheck, the payroll protection program, um, they, the Bank of North Dakota is one of the reasons that they were able to get out the most money to, per worker of any state. And they also just contribute to like a very healthy independent community banking sector, uh, which is uh, one of the best in the, in the country with some of the highest uh, statistics in terms of uh, loan volume per capita um, in, in, the, in the country. Um, so why are we talking about public banking and the climate? Um, you've probably heard the phrase just transition. And um, if you haven't here, this is a good introduction to the concept. Um, I really love this diagram, it shows um, what we need to get from an extractive economy, which is 
foundational to why we're in the climate crisis mm -hmm. to into moving into a living economy or, or regenerative economy, which is one that is sustainable and uh, climate safe. Um, yeah, so, and you can see in, the, in this middle part of the diagram, public banks can both uh, stop the bad and build the new by uh, taking money out of the big banks that are funding fossil fuel companies and major fossil fuel infrastructure, um, while also building the new, investing money, um, including money that's created by the bank, um, into what we need for a climate safe and resilient community, uh, which are things like community solar and resilience hubs and energy efficiency retrofits, um, affordable housing, things that are currently hard to finance because the private sector doesn't think that they're profitable enough. Mm. Um, so, and, and because of, these are things that benefit regular people and not corporations. So, um, and at the same time, it's also changing the rules um, about finance and bringing power to the people. So we know that people and communities want to take action and invest in climate solutions. And what's stopping them is um, the lack of money and power. And this is a way to get that. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, we have one more minute. Okay. And then we're going to open up for the, the panel discussion. All right. I'll just speed through this really quickly. Um, last year, we passed, the California Public Banking Alliance passed this bill, AB 857. That creates a framework so cities and counties t can apply for a bank charter. Um, with the state, um, and it's following the Bank of North Dakota model. Um, the timeline was that the DBO should be issuing regulation sometime this year, probably late in the year, um, and then hopefully sometime in 2021, um, cities and the first cities and counties and regions can start submitting their uh, applications to the state. Um, so. Right now, we're working on AB 310, which is a new bill, which would be about the state infrastructure bank and converting it to a fully fledged public bank. Right now, the, the iBank is an economic development bank, doesn't have money creating power. Um, and we shifted to this because um, we had originally wanted to like work on implementing AB 57 this year, but localities are facing a serious budget crunch um, with the economic downturn. So there's a lot of cities like San Francisco where they're, they're facing a real uphill political battle and trying to get that money to capitalize their public banks. At the state level, we're trying, we've, we've pivoted to this um, and we think that the state public bank would be able to be a, a hub and really help those local public banks get started as well as um, providing immediate recovery relief right now while it's needed. Um, so I can get into more details in the breakouts, and um, I just put up a couple links here for folks who want to look up more information, or if you want to get plugged into a local public banking group, we have chapters all around the state. Um, California Public Banking Alliance is kind of the umbrella organization, and then to learn more about AB310 specifically, we have a special website for that. It's at ab310.org. Awesome. So we're going to open up the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Sylvia. We're going to open up the floor to questions and for all of our panelists. If you have any questions, please send them to me, the moderator, in the chat box, and I'll bring it up to the panelists. But it seems like everyone can, can actually message everyone. So if you want to put in your questions now, um, the panelists will answer. And we're going to uh, split off into breakout rooms at 1055. So. Okay, while we're waiting for someone to formulate the questions, uh, I have one here. How can banking play a role in financing climate uh, mitigation and adaption? Okay, can I answer on that? Yeah. Not, as a, not as an expert on, on, the, on the finance, but I'm really super excited about these ideas that have just been discussed today on the public banking and getting the, the banks or getting a banking system that is more proactively focused towards climate change. And I think that's the way that, that, that it really has got to go. Um, I presented a, um, an idea to the Bank of England um, a while ago, 
um, that they use the insurance market as, as a way of really putting, putting pressure on, um, on, on, on climate change. So the idea being that um, if someone wants to dig fossil fuel out the ground, then they basically pay a third party liability um, um, premium. So that an oil company, you know, who wants a, 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 um, to, to um, run an, an oil platform pays for the insurance of the oil platform, but then also would then pay for some climate change insurance as well. In the same way that when you have a car, you pay insurance that if you hit a pedestrian, that um, that, that pedestrian can, can, can then get recompense. Mm. So we suggested a thing to the Bank of England along that, that, that kind of line to the insurance regulator there, that they were really excited by it, but decided it was above their pay grade and that I needed to go and speak to the politicians. So we spoke to the politicians and said, you need to speak to the bank. And, and, and we ended up in, in a bit of a volleyball game between the Bank of England and, 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 um, and our officials in the UK. But the kind of ideas that we're talking about here, I think are really exciting and they really form an, an interesting bridge um, that hopefully at some stage in the future of it develops, provides a level of control that can't be corrupted through, through normal political processes in the way that's happened really across across the world so i think there's really really super exciting ideas here yeah but i think uh <clears throat> i think sylvia um was alluding that the <clears throat> the public banks can really uh fund living econo economies and maybe uh sylvia or jackie want to answer that unless we have some other questions coming in i think that's that's a really key part of funding um how, how can public banks fund a, a living economy is that what the yeah and, cl and climate um uh sequestration climate resilience yeah yeah uh, i mean so the quest it's basically it applies to any um any kinds of projects that you know like the community wants to see or yeah like the public wants it's in the case of a public bank you actually have some governance and you have some like you some say in what the the bank is lending to so even though you know like we the city of oakland tax taxes me you know holds my, our public money and then puts that into a bank we can't tell the bank what to do with that money and they often will invest it in things that we don't want. And even if, even if we tell them we don't want them to do it, they're, they're not gonna necessarily listen to us. Mm -hmm. So in the case of a public bank, you can say, we want you know 50% of, of lending to go to climate projects. Or you could, say, you could specify, you could say 25% wants to go to uh, regenerative agriculture or you know, whatever is appropriate, whatever uh, makes sense for your community. Um, and this is happening around the world. Um, it's actually not that radical. Um, in Germany, they have, um, they have a development bank called KFW that um, I, I, I think in recent years that about half of their lending is to climate projects. Um, so, there, and that's just one example. There's there's lots of other ones around the world and also in Costa Rica, um, China, other parts of Europe. So yeah, these are definitely doable. It's not really novel. Lots of places have been doing this for over 10 years. Um, it just hasn't picked up in the US yet. Although we're, we're obviously we're getting momentum now. So how, how's this, uh, other than Germany, how's this model been able to work in other countries? Is there uh, any other examples or? Yeah, there's lots of examples. Like, like I said, there's about 700 public banks around the world. Um, and, and there's lots, there's a, a wide variety of models. Um, so in Germany, like there are development banks, which are a little bit more, um, they're not like retail banks that you would walk into and like open a checking account. Um, but they also have like uh, public banks that are, they're called the Sparkhausen network. Um, and it's kind of like they're, I think it's roughly similar to like state level. Um, they're 
those entities have like a savings banks and then so you would go in and open a savings account and then they take those deposits and lend out and they've been uh, financing a lot of solar manufacturing and installation with that money um and uh another model that's really interesting uh is the banco popular in costa rica um which is actually not owned by the government is 100 owned by workers but it is partially controlled like uh, as part of the governance government officials are are, are part of that decision making structure and uh another really interesting part of their their model is that they have a democratization rule that requires uh, gender parity across all levels of, of decision making. So their their highest level of de uh, decision making body is a workers assembly of 290 workers and it has to be 50-50 um, men and women, I think. Um, so those are those are some examples. Um, I think I saw a, a, a question about like how how these would would be governed um, or or what are yeah what are examples of public entities that would run the public banks so um, we're so, so for the city of San Francisco I th they're talking about having one bank for the city the city would own it um, for all of these banks they would have to have independent boards so it wouldn't be like the Board of Supervisors is running it, but like there would be independent directors that would be appointed or um, otherwise picked somehow to to serve on them. Uh, we have a question for Kevin uh, uh, regarding the ion salt solutions. Uh, what mechanisms would disperse the ion salts over the ocean? And are you familiar with the use of sea salt air aerosolization over coral reefs to increase albedo slash decreasing bleaching? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so there's a number of ways that we can disperse. We can use nebulizers, similar to what's being used in Australia at the moment. Um, there's there's um, other methods, um, such as fluidic oscillators, that we can, can use to disperse the salts. Um, Stephen Salter in the UK has been proposing um, a, a remotely controlled ships that can, that can go around the world around the world's oceans and, and, and seed clouds. And we've been speaking to him as well. So there's a number, a, a number of mechanisms that, that, we, that we can start um, developing there. Um, we can just basically burn uh, scrap iron with um, um, hydrochloric acid um, to, to, give, to give us the, 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 uh, the, the iron particles and the, and the chlorine that, 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 that is needed as well. Um, so, so there's a number, number of methods. Well, what, what's particularly nice is of the, you know, of the range of methods, there are methods that could be scaled out simply without high technology. And I think that, that's really one of the, the really important things is that you can build an infrastructure that can last for a prolonged period of time and doesn't need a complex you know, high technology infrastructure to, 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 to support it. So a number, there's a number of options and, and, and that, you know, that's one of the things that we want to explore, you know, what, which particular option is best for which particular purpose. Does that answer the question? That was from Eric Murray. What yeah, about using cargo ships as platforms? Yeah, um, yes, uh, car cargo ships could, could work. Um, th and, and again, that, you know, that, that's, that's something that we have um, been looking at. The, the problem with cargo ships is they don't necessarily go exactly where you want them to go. Um, so there is a potential, um, you know, when it, whenever or not cargo ships would be the, the, um, the best and only solution is, is, um, is, is open for further discussion. But what we really want to do to really help answer these questions is get the initial research going. We, we want to get computer simulations going so we can see what levels of reactivity that we need to take methane out the atmosphere and what level of cooling that we can, that we, that we can deliver. So we want to get that going. In parallel to that, we want to get smog chamber tests going as well. So we can use the computer models to work out the levels of reactivity that we need 
we then use the smog chamber tests to work out the parameters that deliver that level of reactivity. And then we, then we cross link between the, the, those, those two streams of work. Um, so that's really you know, the, the, the sort of first protocol. From that, we can then start really thinking more clearly about the, the different delivery mechanisms. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. It, ironically, there's now cargo ships going through the Arctic because um, there's so much sea loss. And so those cargo ships could be actually dispersing this iron salt and yeah. also cloud brightening, um, releasing, you know, just seawater up in the air um, to brighten the clouds and cool the Arctic, which is, I, I think it's mission uh, um, critical at this point. Um, but as far as citizens getting involved and in how uh, money is spent locally, um, as, as these ballot measures are passed and there's climate, actual climate funds, which is our goal is to have a, an annual climate fund. Um, Berkeley is aiming for $4 million a year. Uh, we'd love to see in Oakland 10, 10 million a year, um, an annual fund that can be spent on climate. And there's, um, in the ballot measures we're proposing, they would be like a citizen committees that would help uh, figure out how to allocate these costs and do the sequestration, um, not just emissions reduction, but actually um, create these profit centers for cities to participate in this um, new industry, which if it's not the biggest industry in the world, climate sequestration of CO2, then we're all going to be... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and I guess one of the big advantages, um, if you can call it that, that California have got is lots of disused mines, which are all belching out methane at, at the moment. And um, in parallel to that, what you've also got is the California cap and trade, which gives a mechanism for pricing methane reduction. So if you've got a mine that's belching methane and we could come along with iron salt aerosol and demonstrate that, um, that the, the application of iron salt aerosol is taking methane out of the atmosphere, then you, you get an immediate uh, financial return through, through the cap and trade. Um, and that's something you can do, you know, that, that California can do on the doorstep and, and having demonstrated the technology in that local area, it then makes it much easier to then scale it out into the Arctic and, and, um, and elsewhere around the world. Uh, so I think there's some real, really powerful synergies that, you know, that we can develop through here. Thank you, Kevin. Wonderful. Uh, Jake, is everyone here? Um, looks like not out of there. Oh, yeah. 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 Looks like we're out here. Okay, cool. Uh, so wrapping up, uh, I just want to thank everyone for participating, the speakers, um, Kevin, Warren, uh, Jackie, and Sylvia. Uh, so at this point, we're going to ask uh, one volunteer from each breakout room to unmute themselves and briefly summarize your work for the whole group. I know it was pretty short, pretty quick. <laughs> but um, yeah. Well, I nominate Kelly to talk about our breakout room, which, whichever, whenever we get to that point. <laughs> um, cool, yeah, Kelly, if, if you wanna summarize what you guys talked about. Sure, uh, yeah, we had a round of great introductions um, from uh, participants from Alameda County, uh, Ventura County, and um, also San Francisco, uh, just talking about different local um, actions that they're taking and local initiatives that are ongoing. And uh, Warren gave us an update of um, kind of how uh, the initiative to get uh, local carbon taxes on local uh, ballots has been a bit tricky because of uh, the COVID response and everyone kind of being uh, focused on that uh, other pressing priority. Um, so now that we're they're asking um, city officials to pass a resolution uh, to get moving on this, um, kind of take other actions involving research on um, kind of how to implement these types of taxes, uh, how to allocate the funds um, and just ensure that um, 
the money is spent effectively. And he also mentioned something that I was wondering about was, you know, what happens if there's a national carbon tax passed. Um, and essentially the answer is we still really need local carbon taxes to implement our um, local climate plans. So thank you so much, Warren, and for all of our participants for sharing your awesome backgrounds and work in this area. Cool. Do we have someone from Group A? Um, put the public banking uh, yes. group. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so we had a great discussion, um, mostly clarifying the two bills that are currently in the process of being developed and being pushed through the legislature. Um, we had a um, great uh, group of people from various different backgrounds, be it from city government and investment background. Um, and so we discussed that we need to invest more in communities that are the most impacted um, and have the least resources to protect themselves and through targets, um, through um, using the resources that are brought about through this public lending, how can we use that to invest in those communities and invest in projects that most benefit those communities and how do we incorporate equity um, within the loans that would be um, harnessed through public banking. Um, yeah, and then we just kind of got more into the details of each specific um, bill. So that was, that was about it. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Emily. It's cool to see the intersectionality between all of these um, issues that we're having and how you know, solution can uh, cover a lot of those. So uh, that brings us to group C, economic and moral imperatives for uh, an accelerated climate intervention strategy. Yeah, so um, we basically we're talking a little bit more of an extension of Kevin's um, panel session, uh, talking about Arctic amplification and how the IPCC can't predict that currently. Um, and how the sea level is going to be much higher than what is currently predicted by the end of the century. And just some kind of, we started talking about some action items that we could possibly take. And we talked about meeting regularly within this panel and doing some ongoing collaboration, just talking more about what can be done. Um, and also talked about different solutions. And one of the ones that came up was the idea of carbon quantitative easing. Um, which is like the current injection of capital that the government did um, recently because of COVID, um, except it would be through service money instead of debt and it would be targeting um, climate issues along with uh, stimulating the economy at the same time. Um, so that was just one of the ideas that came up and yeah, we were just kind of talking more about that. Cool, thank you Sanjita. So um, now everyone, if you can please check the chat box for directions, uh, we'll return to the closing plenary and uh, I guess I'll, we'll see you all in the next room. Thank you all. For Thank you. <laughs> Just some clarification on that. There's a link, um, C-E-M-T-F main room. It's a tiny URL. You can click that and it'll take you right to the other Zoom. And uh, I'll just echo what Christian was just saying. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and to everyone who's attended here. Um, back at the main plenary, um, I understand if you're anxious to get on with your day, but there will be some important announcements um, regarding upcoming events. So I know we were, time was short, um, but these conversations don't have to end today. And there will be four uh, events total. Um, and we're looking for your feedback as well as to how we can improve this experience and make it uh, more effective and meaningful. Uh, for each of you. So please take the time to do that if you're able to do today. Um, we appreciate your time.